Yeah, hello and welcome to ESP Introduction to Programming, um, week two. So last week was on the introduction and a little bit with, with uh, what is data. And today we talk about computational thinking. So the same old lecturers, Alex, uh, is also here. Hello. Hi. I, I hope you can. Hi to Graz. Yeah, I hope you can hear us. Maybe you can give us uh, feedback in the chat if we can hear both of us. The sound hopefully works fine as last week. Just a brief feedback so that we know that everything works. Yes. Everything fine. Perfect. Thank great. You very Thanks much. for the feedback. And great yeah. that so many are already here. 226 people. Wow. That's. Don't tell cool. me, Alex. Makes, makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the streaming room, it, a bit, it is a bit more frightening than um, in a completely different room. As you probably realized, um, my ambiente is somehow a bit strange today. I'm currently in Boston at MIT for a conference, and I'm sitting here on my floor at my Airbnb apartment. Um, just that you know how I suffer for the next hour. I just sit on the floor because the apartment is really small. So, yeah. So you give you give everything for education now. Everything. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so what are we talking about today, Alex? Uh, I already said computational thinking. So yes. what can we expect? That's true. Um, today we will talk about computational thinking. So first of all, I want to give you some idea of what yeah we as computer scientists um, should actually know how we can solve problems, um, which kind of problems we want to solve. And obviously, we will also solve some problems together later on. So this is my part for today, what I want to do with you. And I think David has also something really cool prepared for you. Yeah, so uh, we have something left from last week, um, uh, a little riddle I gave you. And I want to give you a solution for that. And then we talk a little bit about real computational thinking in terms of uh, how computers really think, how they work um, in a very basic level. And uh, yeah, we look at a very simple example, like adding two numbers together and how a computer does that. So this, this is my part then in the end. Cool. But so, at okay. first, uh, we have a little bit organizational part. Only, yeah, a few only two slides, I think. Yeah. So the mentoring. Uh, so you should have received an email. Alex also wrote it on Discord. So if you are not on Discord yet, please join us on Discord, because all the announcements are coming also on the Discord server. So um, please join our Discord server if you haven't already done. Um, yeah, and you should contact your mentor, even if you don't want the mentoring, please write your mentor a short message that you're not interested. It's also totally okay. Um, and also check your emails regularly because sometimes we give you an announcement. That's right. So especially regarding the mentoring, um, the mentors, they do a great job and they, they really want to help you. So um, use that really good offer from the mentoring. But also in case you don't want to do this, this is completely um, voluntary, so you don't have to do this. Um, but in that case, maybe you just write a short message to your mentor and say, hey, thanks for the cool offer, but um, I'm not interested in the mentoring um, because, yeah, so you can also appreciate the work and um, they know that you don't want to do the mentoring. So this is also fine for them. Okay, yeah, the second one is, um, please do not post your solution. So not if you have any code for your assignments, but also if you have a solution for your homework, um, it happens already that somebody, um, yeah, post their approach to solve the homework um, on different channels. So please do not do it because we see it, our tutors can see it. Um, and also we saw it and, um, yeah, it's it's everybody should have their or should 
have the possibility to have their own approach and if you post your solution it's not good for you and also um, some other might copy your solution which is of course not not the way you should do it right okay so then done with the organizational part um, let's make a short recap what we have heard last week at first of course there was a big organizational part last week and then we talked about data types. Uh, we had this Excel sheet with these different types of information. So we had this strings, the characters, um, then floating variables. So the currency was a floating point uh, data type, integers and Boolean variables. So different type of information. And then we talked about uh, the representation of data. So this example, we have the value 22 and we can represent it having a unary system which for you show the binary system then david maybe yeah, in the meanwhile people in the chat can try to write the binary a representation ah, yeah. for 22. Uh, maybe you can remember how it, that was done and david then you can in the meantime explain how the unary system worked perfect yeah so the unary is very simple it's just 22 times the number one uh, because we only have this one symbol um, binary is a little bit more interesting maybe someone in the chat have an idea how it looks like uh, yeah looks that good looks yeah good. so the binary representation of 22 it has two symbols so it's much shorter um, we can count it as so we have here uh, we can count this one as 16. So this one is 16. 16 is um, plus, okay, nothing for the 8. Plus 4, which is 20. Plus 2 is 22. And this is 0 again, so we don't count it, which is 22 altogether. Then maybe a little bit um, more familiar with you, the decimal system, where we have 10, 10 symbols the value 22 with 2 and 2 and the hex symbol I already saw it somewhere in the chat I think um, hexadecimal we have 16 symbols and then it would be written as 1 6 and that's a problem because we do not really know that this is hexadecimal uh, notation so it also can be 16 in decimal and for that it really looks like a decimal 16. It does. Yeah. And it, that's a problem. So hexadecimal, um, short, re uh, short recap. So the first nine characters are the same. It's zero until nine. And then for the number 10, we have an A, B, C, D, E, F. And for the number 16, again, we wrote one zero. So we have one place more than. Um, but this looks completely the same as 10, 11, 12, and so on. So this is a problem. And the solution for that is that hex numbers by convention start with this 0x or 0x uh, to show that this is a hexadecimal counting system. So in general, you write then for the number 15, oxf, for the number 16, ox10, and so on. So then you can differentiate the decimal system and the hexadecimal system. Just because it was a question here in the chat, um, how does a program separate two symbols in unary? How does it know when a symbol ends? To be clear, in computer science, we use a binary representation and usually so like on, on, on the very low level. Um, so unary is just a, a way to represent like numbers in a different format. So um, for example, also the decimal system, that is just showing you different um, types of, of systems, digit systems, and that doesn't mean they all are applied in computer science, but David had tried to give you some general information how these systems would work and how you can, could calculate in them, actually. Exactly, and the, the reason for that, why computers use a binary system is that it's pretty easy for computers to differentiate between no electricity and there is electricity so zero and one and let's say we have 
three symbols. We only could write it as no electricity, half electricity and full electricity. And you cannot differentiate that easy between half electricity and full electricity. So that's the, the yeah, main point of, of computer science, of computers. It's easy to, dif to differentiate or to distinguish if there is power or no power, so zero and one. And the binary system works very, very well for that. That's right. Okay, so, and then also Alex talked a little bit about different representations again, so characters, how can we represent characters? And the ASCII um, model or the, the ASCII, um, how do you say? representation um, yeah. code yeah um, is is one of the most common one of the most basic one um, so each letter um, has an own representation so a number for example here the the a is represented as the number 65 and this also has the binary representation uh, 0100001 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is 65 and if you want to interpret it as a letter 65 then you can say okay that's an a and we end with this um, riddle i give you and i want to ask again so what this data could be anybody any guesses uh, what this can be so maybe in the chat you can write a few ideas So is there any meaning behind it? An array, yeah. So we have zeros and we have ones, but you also have two, five, three. So it won't be unary, it won't be binary. It looks like decimal because it doesn't have this OX of the hexadecimal in front. So it looks like a decimal representation. I give you a little bit more hint. So let's bring it into a, a two-dimensional format. It's the same values, so only in a two-dimensional format now. A bitmap, yeah, that's very technical. <laughs> Pixel values, that sounds good. Um, the next hint would be, so let's say Every zero is the color white, every one is the color red, every two um, represents dark brown, three represents blue, four yellow, five black and six light brown. And if we color that and if we interpret these numbers like that, we saw this little picture. And yeah, Super Mario. I, I hope that you already... Cool. I hope that you recognized it. So even nowadays, Super Mario is present. And I think um, that David draws Super Mario on his own. So actually, um, I think we should really appreciate his effort that he put into <laughs> this awesome picture. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a struggle, to be honest. Take, take, it took a half an hour, I think to get all the pixels where I want them. Um, yeah, but it, it, looks, really it looks nice. Really nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and if we remove the numbers, then we can really say, okay, that's a, a pixel art. So it's just because we know how to interpret the values we had, we can now draw also um, pictures, for example. Yeah, so the... How can we represent colors then? I already showed you a little bit like that. So each value in my example had a predefined color. Uh, a, a common standard is the so-called RGB, uh, a color space which includes red, green, and blue. And each of these colors had a value between zero and 255. And maybe some of you have noticed it's again this magic value 255. Um, for red, for green, and for blue. So we have three times the value from 0 to 255, which is uh, 
eight, uh, one byte, so 8 bit. With 8 bit, we can represent 256 different um, numbers, so from 0 to 255. And as you can see here, for example, if you have the numbers 255, 0, 0 for red, green, and blue, then it turns out that it's red, and so on. So you can mix all these values and then you get a different color. And this is really just how you want to interpret these numbers. So again, a short question to you in the chat, what this might be, which color could this be? So we have 255 in red, so it's much in red, then 102 in green and 255 in blue. Yeah, I see already an expert um, who knows that. Yeah, that's pink, a very nice looking pink. And also interesting, uh, maybe some of you know this notation of colors. And we also talked about this decimal representation and the hexadecimal representation. And as you can see here, so the decimal value is of 200 or the, the hexadecimal value of 255 is OXFF, which is this one here. And the decimal value 102 is in hexadecimal OX66, uh, which then corresponds to, to this value. So this is just, again, uh, another representation of these RGB values. And maybe you saw it already in some color pickers. Uh, you can enter these values or you can also manipulate this um, this yeah, text here, where it, which is just a hex representation of the RGP values. So the same problem or the same content, just a different representation. And actually that's a cool thing because you might have realized that this is uh, like the RGP or the hex representation of numbers. Um, you can often see in different programs, I don't know, PowerPoint, Adobe products, GIMP, whatever. So this is actually the really cool thing um, because the question in the chat was, how does this differ to the Adobe RGB? And actually it doesn't, it's the same. So RGB is like a general representation, how you can represent colors. And so this is the same for everything. Um, or I don't know, maybe you have used a color picker already and color pickers usually um, give you the hex representation of a number. Um, so this is pretty cool, actually, because this is a way how to represent, um, yeah, colors. Yeah, with just um, three times one byte. So very less information is needed to represent color. And that's, that's very cool. Okay, cool, so yeah. that was it from, from the remaining part of last week. Um, we now talk about problem solving and Alex, I think it's, this is your main part. So what do you show us today? Yeah, I will show you, I will say it in a minute, but there was a question if I can also have transparent colors and it was just, um, it was just answered in the chat. Um, this is also possible with, um, hex for example, but there is a so-called alpha value and this can also be represented as um, as value. So I can also say how um, the alpha value is and this is the opacity level then, which means transparent. So um, yeah, but Miras explained it perfectly fine already in the chat, just for information. All right, problem solving. Um, today we will try to get into yeah, this idea on how to solve technical problems together. And therefore we have two problems that we actually want to um, solve together. Two problems um, from a technical domain, from a very general domain as well. So yeah, maybe we, want to figure out how we can solve technical problems and therefore we need special techniques and strategies that we want to um, we want to use. Actually, 
our goal should be to think like computer scientists. And this is what this course should do, actually. We want to give you some way to think like a computer scientist, um, certain way of thinking about problems, and therefore we will give you some strategies over this course. And today we will begin with something very basic, which probably every one of you can follow. So let's see what this will be today. And actually, we have a very general example for today. So um, imagine the following situation. You're moving to a new place, uh, and you have a bunch of books. Like you, Overall, you have, I don't know, 150 books or something like that. So a huge amount of, of books that you also have to use to, uh, that you also want to carry to your new place, actually. Um, and as computer scientists, we now try to organize the books in our new bookshelf in a smart way so that we can find stuff and yeah, whatever. So this is our task actually. And the question now is, how do we deal with that? What do we want to do exactly? Um, and yeah, I will show you a picture now of some the books or like the bookshelf itself. And it looks like a mess. Um, when you look at this picture, actually, is there anything where you say, okay, wow, this is interesting, anything in particular where you say, okay, um, this makes sense or any patterns that you recognize in that or whatever? I, I like I mean, this I, 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 I saw it already <laughs> in the, yeah, this is pretty cool. This is interesting, yeah, to sort it like that. Color, yeah. Yeah, color is a huge thing here. Um, I, I read several approaches um, already in the chat, which are not really interesting for us today. So something like bubble sort, merge sort, or whatever. Um, we won't talk about these things today. This is very uninteresting for us today. We want to have a very easy approach. Therefore, we don't want to go into technical detail yet. Um, but for now on, I would say, yeah, colors are definitely a pattern here. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. The, um, yeah, this and, is... and yeah, the, the question, um, what other information could be interesting for us when we want to reorganize our bookshelf? So just, just drop in the, in the chat, what information does a book provide that might be interesting for us? We have a title, yeah, that's, that's good, we have a genre. And an author. Yeah. Date of release, that's interesting, actually. Would you say that we want to organize, uh, like, um, we want to organize according to the release date, for example? Would you do that, actually, for example? Maybe someone would do that. So it's no right or wrong here. The ESPN, maybe? Well, the ESPN, yeah. Do I need it really? I don't know. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Topic. Thickness of the book. That's interesting. Publisher as well. Yeah. So you see, we, we have a few different ways how we could organize it. Another thing that you might have realized, um, not every information that the book has is important for us when we want to reorganize our bookshelf. Um, because I don't know, in my opinion, the ESPN number is not really important when reorganizing book. I don't know if, if someone probably sorts it like that, but I wouldn't do that actually. So there is some information that we want to keep and some information that we don't need in that context, but the book has this information. Um, also probably, um, I don't know, the, the yeah, publisher, for example, this is something that I'm not really interested when I uh, reorganize my books usually. Okay, um, what else could we, um, think of i mean there are some patterns one pattern that we already recognized is that we have different colors um what else are patterns probably in a book any ideas what patterns do we see when we um have this bunch of books actually like when you have a look at books what else do you yeah i really saw the, the number of the number of pages maybe or the size yeah. of the book size the color i think we already talked about yeah 
the genre, that's I think, true. it also had the, uh, the genre or the category of a book. Yeah, category of a book, that's true. Hard cover, soft cover, something like that. That's also a good part. So these are different patterns that we um, recognize. The weight of a book, yeah, sure. Bounder pocket books. Ebook or physical book, actually, also interesting question. In that case, we reorganize our <laughs> physical bookshelf. Um, so um, we can have the um, situation here that this is just for physical books, actually. Yeah, the price, okay. So you see, we have different patterns. Um, yeah, so the question now is, how do we want to organize our bookshelf in order that we find something? So as we already said, what we have is we have different patterns in our book. We have different data in our book. How could we organize the books now in the bookshelf to find something? So it's not about how to find something. It's about how to organize it to find something. Any ideas that are practically in a real life context because a hash map could be an approach, <laughs> but probably not the best approach in a physical bookshelf with 100 people. Alphabetical order. So the title actually. Yeah, that's interesting. What else? Name a few. Maybe how the libraries do it. Alphabet. Categorization, yeah. So the group, uh, group the books by a category. The author, um, yeah. Mention 3D asked a good question. Shouldn't we know how to find a book or to search a book? Yeah, that's a good point. But first we will think about the organization and then um, how we want to find something. Genre alphabetical, yeah, that's also interesting. Um, I have another approach actually that I want to show you. Um, maybe go one slide further. Okay, color, okay. yeah, that was not what yeah. I want to show. Okay, I think probably it's not on the slide. Um, popularity would also be a, um, okay. a way to do that. So actually, um, so that you read more often would be like on the very beginning and all the other would be then like on the back of the bookshelf. So there is also this way to, to organize um, your book so you can just get and grab very easily the books that you really need to have in that context. Popularity is subjective, that's true. But since it's my bookshelf, um, I sort it according to what I want to have. Um, so in a library, probably not the best idea, actually. Uh, you're completely right with that. But since I want to organize it at my place, um, I would organize it probably according to popularity. And um, obviously, there are some books also in libraries that you sometimes see which are um, more popular than other books. So this might be, even though if it's subjective, um, a probably a good measure. Um, you will hear about that in data science subjects as well. Good. Um, yeah, how can I find books on the bookshelf? Um, any ideas? Please, no technical words. Like, I don't want to hear some algorithms. I just want to hear ideas how to find something. How often may I need it? That's interesting. Yeah. Go around, yeah. Having good eyes, that's that's also a good approach, yeah. <laughs> through all books, go through each book. Markers, ah, good, 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 like that. Look for book. Looping through, yeah. Lucky guessing, also a good approach, yeah. <laughs> Smell, <laughs> right? Take a random each time until you get one can be a very long approach, but also possible, sure. It is, it is a valid approach, yeah. It's a valid approach. Have a list um, to check instead. Uh, also like this idea, it's kind of a database approach where you have a list with all the books and then you see each position. Yeah, that's, that's also interesting. <laughs> By sound, yeah. Okay. Start from left to right. Yeah, so my, exactly my ideas are, for example, you could um, group um, books by title, you could group it by author or by popularity, for example, or by usage. Um, and then you have subgroups that you want to search. 
change in. Um, you could also, of course, say, okay, alphabetically from A to C, all the letters, and go through. The cool thing, if you were, if you would solve it, or if you would organize them in an alphabetical way, and you know you want to have a book with S, you might not start at the very beginning. You might start somewhere in the middle or like um, the second half of the bookshelf, because from like a mathematical perspective, um, it cannot be in the first half. So this is also an interesting approach, um, which you might encounter in many approaches to find things. And we will yeah, do actually, next week. Next week we will do a little bit more and a little bit more technical way of, of um, tackling this approach. So a little bit of cliffhanger for next week. Um, again, we want to find something. Exactly. Finding things is um, something that we will do a lot in computer science and you will realize that very soon. This is one of the problems that we um, always want to solve in a way. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The point is, now we organize the bookshelf. That's pretty cool. But how does this somehow can be applied to computer science? And yeah, to summarize that, there was a lot of computer science in that. We had a book, physical book, physical thing, and we tried to abstract information out of it. So we tried to get some information out of what a book is. Um, we tried to have a model, a mental model of what the book represents, author, title, genre, whatever. Um, further, we thought of ways how we can use this data to organize things. And this is also something that we need a lot. Organize information, organize data, and work with that. And find a good way how we can use this data um, to do something with the data, to make operations on the data, to find something, for example. And there is a lot of computer science in that example. Um, and to make it a bit more technical, I have another um, example now that I want to go through with you. And this yeah, so what's that? To a technical component. Yeah, what, what do you think what this is, actually? Question in the chat. Yeah, it's an image. <laughs> <laughs> an Bending image machine. of a vending machine, yeah, to be exact. An yeah. <laughs> image of a vending machine, yeah. Um, and by the way, I made this picture yesterday with um, an AI tool because I'm at the conference regarding AI technologies. And um, I wanted to try that actually because one of the presentators told us how he generates images with AIs for um, educational purposes. And during the workshop, I um, thought I want to try this as well. But I think it's it's pretty cute. So I, I really like that. I really like that a lot. Um, was a very easy approach actually to generate it. Yeah. Maybe maybe a, a vending machine for, for, for God because it's in the sky or in the clouds. So not for people. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I didn't use Midjourney because the question was in the chat. Um, I used Bing actually. Um, usually I use Midjourney for generating images, but um, I haven't used Bing for that already. And um, it's working um, on the DALI. And um, that was the reason why I wanted to try it because in my opinion, Midjourney does a better job. And I'm, I'm a bit biased since I work with Midjourney from day one. And so I wanted to try something different and I had the chance yesterday to work with Bing, which actually worked really fine. So if you haven't done that, play around a bit with that. This is really cool, actually, what you can generate. Um, but yeah, um, you have to play a lot around with prompts that you find really good um, or get really good generations and results. Yeah, whatever, um, side story. So what should a simple vending machine actually do? Um, it's pretty easy. We really want to have a very, very simple vending machine, which is not really clever. Um, a vending machine will wait for coins, actually. So that means at some point, someone will throw in the coin, hopefully. Um, then I select a payment, cash or card. Um, and then the payment is processed and I get my drink. So as I said, very simple vending machine, it just has one drink or 
um, one product with the same price, so I don't have any choice what to select. Keep it very, very simple for this um, time. We can, of course, think about um, like more interesting vending machines where I have also selection, different prices, stuff like that. But I wanted to keep it very, very low level for now on. Okay, so we have our requirements. Let's think of a way how we can represent this information or this process now. Actually, I have a representation today for you, which is very common in computer science. It's called a flowchart diagram. Might have, uh, some of you have might used this already in school probably, or saw it in other domains as well. So it's also something that you sometimes use in economy. Um, and yes, we go over a flow chart, which is a representation actually yeah. to, no worries, which is a representation <laughs> to show how something works or how some process can be done. Some of you might have done this in school a lot of times already. So um, I hope I don't, um, yeah, make you feel like very traumatized with that. Now I did this a lot in school, so I was really traumatized with that, but it's a good way actually to present things. So first of all, we have a starting point, which is like on the very beginning. And um, from this starting point on, we want to think of um, the vending machine. And first thing that the vending machine should do is say, hi, welcome. So this would be very nice if we have like a nice prompt, which says, welcome. Okay. Um, you might see this symbol, and this symbol, um, the green ones, um, means output or input. So the machine says something, or we can put some value to the machine. Okay, next step is to set the input to zero. Um, why should I do this, actually? Any ideas? Maybe someone in the chat wants to... Um, comment on that. Why should I set the input to zero? And what does this mean exactly to set the input to zero? Yeah, set to default, no coins. So we have a variable, whatever, some data storage, and we reset that. Um, because otherwise, um, there might be some input already in and um, because the person that bought some drink earlier um, forgot to put it out. And so we want to reset it that the person or that the machine gets the maximum out of it. So yeah, let's start with zero. I think this is um, somehow very clear. Okay, next step would be to actually provide the user with um, a type of payment. So we want to provide two types, cash on the one hand and card on the other hand. And so we have a decision to make. And this looks like that. So whenever you have the symbol with the arrows in two directions, this means we have a choice, we have a decision that we can make. We have a condition. And the condition is, um, will the user um, pay with cash? So put like a banknote in or coins in or a credit card. Okay, so depending on that, um, we will go further with, I think with the cash branch, both branches actually. Um, so again, we have the input, card or cash. Okay, now I think, uh, I think I want to pay by cash. By cash, all right. So if you pay by cash, um, we will do the following thing. Um, we have input plus cash. So input equals input plus cash, which makes sense because when I just hit um, 10 cents in, um, this is probably not enough. And so I have to put money as long in as um, it has the right amount actually in the vending machine. All right. What happens if I put money in the vending machine? I have another decision. The decision is, is my input already all the price. I have a price of one euro, and if I have just 90 cents in it, it's not enough. And in that case, I have to go back actually to the very beginning uh, and repeat that. And for the purpose of holding it very simple, I go back to the select payment type, so I could also split the payments. I mean, yeah, it's one euro probably for a water, 
So um, everyone should be able to pay in cash or with card, but in my approach, both would be actually possible. So let's yeah. go to the next the, step, actually. The same is also with card, I think. So The same is with card, yeah. So if the payment was not successful, um, it will go up again to the select payment type. So okay. we have a no branch, actually, which says, okay, no, that doesn't work. Uh, because payment was not successful, we don't have enough money on our card, or we have too less money on the coin, whatever. And obviously, we also have a yes branch then. And yes means um, the payment was successful, and in that case, we will receive our drink, actually. Um, and then the system says, thank you so much. And at the end of the day, after that, we're basically with that. Yeah, so this is our flowchart actually. Um, yeah, what's with change? As I said, we keep it very simple. There is no change today. Um, <laughs> we have this exact no change, um, especially since we want to make some additional benefit of the system, and so we don't give. It's a scam, yeah, actually. We, we, we are very, very greedy. <laughs> yeah, no money back. But of course, there, the, there, are, the, there are many policy. improvements. Yeah. <laughs> sure, there are many improvements. This is just the first approach how we can um, define such a vending machine. Actually, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is actually the question that I wanted to ask you. What could we do to improve the machine, actually? Um, what would be nice improvements? And some of you might have already mentioned that. Um, we give, don't give any change. What else would you think? Yeah, <laughs> I expected that actually we don't select any product. So that would be actually a really nice um, feature to have products. Display the current input, of course. To cancel an product. option, yeah. Cancel is also a good point, yeah. Display the price, we haven't done that as well. Text output if something failed, sure. Maybe a, a secret, secret combination of values where I then get everything for free. Sure, I use that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give change back. Yeah, the change is maybe the most important improvement. Yeah. To to exactly. give people the money back. So, if someone give you a, a 10, 10 euro, and it's only one euro, what it costs. I think I yeah. would be annoyed if it uh, if it didn't get back my my nine euro. Definitely, definitely. So as you see, there are different um, ways to improve it. Of course, um, my idea was to have a very easy approach for a vending machine that just does a very simple job, um, which is not perfect, of course. But yeah, as you saw, you can in any way improve it, make some ideas in that. Um, if you want, of course, you can rework on that and do some cool changes by just using a few symbols. And um, if you can go to the next slide, I will show you about them. Um, there are many flowchart um, symbols. And of course, you can check the internet. There are like, tons of literature about flowchart diagrams. They're very similar to, to these notations, but sometimes you see a bit different, as it always is with notations. So the very left symbol means something is processed. So as we earlier had, that the payment is processed, for example, or something like that. Um, next to that, we have a conditional or a decision. That means actually we're at a point where we have two branches, for example, payment by this, payment by that, um, enough money in yes or no, whatever. So we have a decision and we want to repeat something, for example, or go to, or go to a different branch. That's also the case with these conditionals. We have input and output. So we, on the one hand, can give information into the process, like data, like coin or whatever. On the other hand, um, the process itself produce any kind of output 
that we get. And at the very right, we have terminal, which means um, beginning or end. Sometimes you just see um, a round symbol. Sometimes you see it like that. So there are, as I said, different notations. Um, but something like this at the beginning or the end means that this program or the process terminates here is over. So maybe we can back. I can go back. Um, so this is the, the terminal, the start. Yeah. These are the, the input and output fields here. This is a condition, so it, depending on what the user um, says or what um, in this case is enough, is, is the price already or is the input high enough? Um, or and do what I go back? It's interesting here, and yeah, exactly, this comeback part is interesting here because at the first decision, um, it's a decision that doesn't have any repetitions in it. And with the input or with the payment, um, it goes back actually. And this is the cool thing yeah. of flowcharts. You have these loops, um, Schleifen, which will repeat things um, until some condition is true or whatever. Um, and this is a concept that we will use a lot in computer science. Uh, an interesting and, and very good question in the chat. Shouldn't there be an error going from output back to start, Alex? Um, we could do that, for example, yeah. Or to um, the, we also have probably could have a delay, which after five seconds, that kind of variant goes back to um, output welcome. So that would also work, of course. Sure. So, of course, if you're finished with one transaction, the next one should be able to, to buy another one. Yeah. Exactly. As I said, very simple representation of this process. Um, the question was also, do we need to make uh, flowcharts in this course? No, and you don't need to. This is probably the first and last time you see flowcharts in this course, since it's not the focus. It's just a way how we can represent um, processes in computer science. Um, you will learn and see a lot of them. And in other courses, you might have to work with flowcharts. In our course, you don't have to do that. Yeah, so that's um, in general. So the, the last week and also today and maybe also next week, these are all the fundamentals um, which are indirect. Um, yeah, a, a good fundamental for you to know. So I would definitely recommend you to, to stay and, and listen to us. But it's not really, um, yeah, in the in the in the exams so all this is a fundamental basic knowledge which you get then to make the programming start for you easier and then the exams will be mainly about the programming part which is or which we start in in a few weeks right okay also, yeah, I think we're also that yeah also that what i want to show you now is um not something that you really have to know um, of course not this is mainly thought uh, or mainly taught in next semesters um, where you have a more common and a, a more deep insight into it but uh, we thought that's interesting for us also to yeah give you a very um, yeah at the start of your career to give you a short overview also how a computer thinks and um, also questions in the chat. Um, so this is no part of the exam. I give you a, a very German answer for that, Jein. Um, <laughs> because, for example, in analysis or other math subjects, you won't get a truth table for an exam, actually. Um, but this is knowledge that you need to have, actually. So you probably don't have to draw something like that. But this is an important skill that you have to do other things in this course. So we build on this knowledge. So if you probably don't have to do a flowchart, you have to um, write a technical problem description in program code. And so for this reason, this is definitely the fundament that you need to have. And if you can't follow that, you might have some issues with um, courses or with lectures in the following weeks. So as David said, this is not for the exam, so you don't have to draw flowcharts, but this is knowledge that we build on, so you definitely will need that for the exam actually at the end. 
Exactly. So a nice comment is that the, the English word for yain maybe is yesn't. Yeah, that's not so appropriate than yain. I think yain <laughs> is one of the strongest German words. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's start with the last part of today, maybe, um, where we create a very, very basic and simple computer together and then have a look if, uh, yeah, how this computer works. So Alex talked about this very simple vendoring machine where we have basic input, output, basic uh, calculations. We add something, maybe we add two numbers or uh, something like that. And I want to show you now how this really works um, yeah, in, inside a computer. So how a computer calculate all these things. Before that, maybe we can talk a little bit about the very most common and the, the basic components of a computer. So maybe in the chat you can give us uh, a few guesses. What are the main components of a computer? CPU sounds already quite good. CPU, RAM, yeah, RAM, processing unit, memory, perfect. So we have, and of course, uh, of course, this is really a very basic and a. Uh, a simple representation. Of course, we know that there's so much more, but we want to have it uh, very, um, have, just give you an overview and have a very basic. So we have a CPU, I already saw that we have a main memory or Hauptspeicher or RAM, also random access memory. And then we also have uh, Ein- und Ausgabe, input, output, where then all the CPU and the memory talk to, to disk, so the festplatte, to the hard disk, to the network, uh, to keyboard and other things which are connected to the computer. But um, we mainly talk now about the CPU and the main memory because they are the, yeah, let's say the big players who do all the magic when uh, calculations and happens, yeah. So let's talk at first about the main memory and the RAM. This, I hope um, most of you have already seen this. This is an example of uh, RAM. And here these black boxes are the memory locations, so to say. So imagine that we have like a grid over one of these um, memory locations. Of course, there are many more locations that, than just that, but um, this is just an example. And these locations can be empty, so like that, there is no value stored, or there can be values stored. So in this case, here is 5 and 4 stored, here is 3 and 2 stored, and the other locations are, there are no values stored in, currently. So we have uh, values and we also do have addresses here where we can refer, refer or we can call values and these addresses are commonly used hexadecimal values for that so for example at the address ox1 ox2 I can see here that this is the number four for example so addresses are most commonly uh, written in hexadecimal because they're very big numbers most of the time. Another representation of the, of the same um, memory is, okay, we know in computers they do not yeah, represent really the, the decimal values, but binary values. So here we have again the number five, here we have the number four, this is the number three and this is the number two. So exactly the same like here, but in binary representation and this, so this is um, eight bits, one byte, and we can represent numbers from zero to 220, uh, 255 into this one byte. Um, if we need higher numbers, we need to merge maybe these two or these four um, memory locations, then we can represent higher numbers. 
But in our case, so we talked about characters and we talked about um, colors, for example, they can all or can all be represented by one byte. So David, this mean this means if you want to represent, for example, the color red, yeah. um, then I need three of the spots in the memory, right? Exactly. So um, red, green, and blue. Everybody needs eight bits, so one byte. So for for one color, I need this, for example, here, this one, and this one. So I need three of the bytes to represent one number. That makes sense. So in, in this uh, example, or this memory, can only store 48 values. Not that much. Um, as a comparison, an 8 gigabyte memory can store about 10 billion values. So in Nowadays, eight gigabyte is maybe not, or most of you have 16 maybe, or even higher. Um, but with 10 gigabyte, you can store 10 billion values, which is pretty much, I think. So the conclusion of the main memory, and of course, as I already said, this is really just a basic overview of it. Um, we can store values and each of these entries where we can store values has an address and a fixed size. And our fixed size was always this 8-bit or 1-byte where we can store the values. Next component we talk about is the CPU, so the central processing unit. And the central processing unit is responsible for execute instructions. And I know this is a little bit technical, so of course you do not have to understand the next slides completely, um, but I just want to give you an overview of how this works. So the CPU read instructions, it's also called fetch, and then execute instructions. So the components are, uh, in general, the arithmetic logic unit, I already saw it in the chat before, which really executes arithmetic and logic operations. Then we have a control unit where it controls the data flow and some registers where the data is stored. So for the registers, um, in most cases, nowadays we have four registers to store values inside the CPU, which are called EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. Um, so we, we really just have only four places inside the CPU where we can store data. That's interesting. That means, well, we, we have no, like, we just have four spaces to store actual information inside the CPU. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's so that's interesting because yeah. in the in the main memory we have, I don't know, ten billion of of values to to store. Um, yeah. But in the CPU, yeah, it's four. it's wow. it's okay that we only have four, yeah. Not a lot. And there are also some special registers like the program counter and the instruction register. The program counter saves the location of the next instruction, and the instruction register um, saves the current instruction. So we talked now of much about instructions, and I will give you an overview of what an instruction can be in, in, in short. But just to um, conclude that, so a CPU fetches data, so it loads uh, an instruction, it loads the next instruction into the program counter. So the next instruction then um, is, or that it loads the next instruction from the RAM into the instruction register, so to say, yeah. Then it, it, there's a decode phase where the instruction is interpreted and then there's an execute phase where the commands, where the command in the instruction register is executed. I know that's a little bit theory and we will come to a very basic example in a few minutes which should make it more clear for you. But at first I talked a little bit about instructions and how do instructions look like? Maybe someone in the chat could say or have a guess 
What is an instruction of a computer? What could this be? Mm, that's a good question, actually. What do you think? What instructions do we need inside of a CPU to work with data? And how can they look Load, like? Right. Move. Mm -hmm. We have move, add. Yeah, it's already some interesting ones. Okay. Or not and, yeah, that's also interesting instructions, which are true, yeah. But at first I want to show you, so instructions are really just data. Let's say we have this type of information, this type of data, and we can, as we have saw, we can interpret it in so many ways. And if we interpret it as instruction, or we can rewrite this, for example, in the decimal values, we can rewrite it as hexadecimal. It doesn't really matter because it's only important how we interpret it. So it, it could be values, it could be a color, or it could be an instruction. So this bits here, these bytes, can also be interpreted as, um, as an instruction for a computer. And that's an important point because we talked about that also in the last week. Data in our computer is just data it has no yeah. meaning and it needs a meaning to actually work with that data so as i said this could also be a bitmap this could be part of a game whatever so this can be anything um but within the context where it's used it gives the data meaning and then we can work with the data actually exactly yeah and we already will see it then in the in the example i have for you that the instructions and the values really look completely the same and then there is the instruction set architecture or ISA, which is something like uh, the definition of the language of CPUs. So it gave this, it, it gives this, um, this instructions or this data a meaning. For example, there's instruction types, there are arithmetic instructions, transport instruction, uh, instructions where you can move data from one location to another, logic instructions, jumps and control instructions. And we will come to that a little bit later. But at first, let's look at this basic example. We have here in the memory, let's say this data. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And we can interpret it using this instruction set architecture. So the language the CPU speaks we can interpret the first two bits as, let's say, this means we add something. The next two bits indicates the register, okay, the, the value in the register EAX. And we add this value with the next two bits, which um, is just EBX. And then we have the last one is the destination register. ECX, and if we have this example or these bits, the instruction could be add the values of these both of these two registers and write the result into this register. And this is pretty cool because it doesn't matter what is in the registers actually. So David just says we have two registers, and in, in these registers is whatever data. So it does not depend, um, and we add them. So we have an add command and we add these two registers and write it to this register. So this is perfectly fine. Exactly. So I know that was a little bit theory. We come now to a basic example, a very, very basic example, maybe one of the most basic examples a computer can do. We want to look how our computer operates um, or calculates the, this equation 10 plus 15. So what this could be, I think everybody knows of us what is the result, but how do a computer um, yeah, calculate this? So our simple computer now, as 
uh, has uh, a bit size of 8 bit, as we already have seen it before. We have a very, very small RAM with 16 values. That's enough for us now. So not 8 gigabyte or more. So only 16 values. So this is our main memory, just to have a better overview. We have your addresses for a better overview for now, also in binary representation. And as you can see here in this line, for example, this um, it can store here an 8-bit value, so 256 possible values to represent. And these are the memory locations here. So we have 16 memory locations. And as you or already might have seen, here is some data in the beginning. Then there are there's no data inside and here is data again inside which has a meaning of course and we will come to it in a few slides so our simple computer also has a cpu of course we have uh, the four registers eax EBS, ebx ecx and edx and we code them with this binary number 00011011. We also have this special registers, the program count and the instruction register. And we also have four instructions in our instruction set. We can add something, we can store, we can load something. So store and load is to access the main memory. And we can halt. So we just stop the machine. So here are the registers. These are in the control unit, the special registers, and the arithmetic logic unit does all the calculations for us. And in this control unit, the instruction register points to the instruction, so to this bit value here, and the program counter just points to an address where the next instruction is stored. This might be again a little bit, um, yeah, much information for now, but this is our instruction set. So we have four instructions, add, load, store, and halt. So stop the program, add, adds two values of two registers and then writes the result into another one load loads the data from main memory and then we have uh, a register where we store the data and the memory location store is the opposite we store data from the registers to the main memory and if we stop it just say this operation code one one so this is an example here um, if we have if we have an instruction with the bit 0101111. Uh, one, we look first here at the instructions. Okay, it looks like a load because we want to load something. Then the next two bits says that uh, the destination, in this case 01, which is a register, and we want to load the information from this memory location, 1111, into the register. I know a little bit much uh, for now, but we will have four instructions now where we can uh, yeah, make it all a little bit clearer for, for you. So, Are there any questions maybe, in the meantime, Alex? OK. Um, there are some no's in the chat. So I um, probably want to hold here for a second. Haha. <laughs> and give you the chance to ask questions. So it is something, do we explain something not appropriate enough? Do you need some clearer? I think, I think, yeah, I there think it's, it's very around. theoretic, I know, um, but I just want to give you an overview. And if we do the example uh, now, it will be much clearer for you. So trust me, at so the, at this, the example, you will get it. This instruction set is really stupid it has just four commands yep. um a, a cpu doesn't have just four commands this is really very basic very basic instructions but for now on we just want to have a very 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 simple cpu isa instructions and architecture just with add load and store so it cannot do anything more than 
getting data from the uh, from the main memory, adding numbers, and storing the data back. So this is the entire purpose of our CPU. It doesn't do that much. We know about that, but it's very simple. And um, modern architectures from for for CPUs, of course, they support lots of lots of lots of instructions. But this is just to get the basics actually. And David has prepared a really cool example that we go through now. And um, I can also promise this makes it much clearer. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So this is an overview of our simple computer. We have the CPU, we have a connection to the main memory, and in the main memory, we have here the code of the program, so the instructions. And then we have here in the main memory, our values already stored. You can see here, I have an explanation. So this value here is 10. So we want to compute 10 plus 15. And this value here is 15. So we already have this information, but we want to compute the result now. Okay, let's start with the first instruction we want to do. And in, in the beginning, we want to load the value 10 into the registers inside this CPU. So the first is always we look at the, at the program counter, which points to an address. In this case, 0000. And here we have an instruction. So this is the data. So we load this instruction into our instruction register. And the instruction is just 01001110. This is our instruction. Not very meaningful for us now, but if we have our instruction set architecture, so we can have a look what this means, what this instruction really means, and then we can execute this instruction. So look at looking at this register uh, at this uh, instruction here. I've already pointed it here again. Looking again, we have the first two values are zero and one. The operation code zero and one is a load which means in general we want to load data from the main memory. So we already have these two bits, so the first two bits. Then the next bits are 0, 0 here. 0, 0, the next bits are the destination register. A register is really just a point where you can store data inside the CPU. So the CPU cannot operate right on the main memory. The yeah, CPU exactly. needs the data in the registers to work with the data. Exactly. So every time um, when the CPU yeah, wants to do some calculation, it al always has to get the data from the main memory to the CPU. So load it inside the CPU, load it in one of these registers. And then there can be the calculations done. Right. And which value do we want to load from the memory address 1110? So in, in other words, our instruction is load the value from the main memory with the address 1110 and write it into the register 00. So this is all what this instruction here or this instruction says. So going back to our simple computer, I have um, also written it here now. So load the values from the main memory with the address 1110. So this is this value here. This is the address and this is the value. And write it into the register 00, which is this register. So the executing the instructions and I've pointed it out here again, just a better overview. We now have this number 10 or in bit um, 00001010 in this first register here. That's our first instruction. So our first instruction is done. That's the most basic thing um, maybe a, a CPU can do. Just load something from the main memory. Let's start with the second instruction. The second instruction is yeah, pretty much the same. We want to load now the next 
number. So we want to calculate 10 plus 15. So we have 10 already here in the registers. And we also need the number 15, which is here in our register. Then we can do, more then we can do the calculation. But at first, we need also this number in the register. So we increase the program counter to 0001. So the program counter just increments on one. And then we have here again a next instruction. We load this instruction into the instruction register. And then again, we have a look. What does this instruction mean for us? So the instruction 01011111. Does mean again a load. So it's again a load instruction, the same as before. The operation code is 01. So the first two bits are 01. And we know that's, that's an instruction. So the instruction is a load. Again, it's the same as before. We have then a, a register, a destination register. Where do we want to store the data? Last time we stored it in 00, zero so in the first register. Now we store it in 01, so the second register. And from where do we get the values? From the memory address 1111. So in text, we want to load the values from the main memory with the address 1111 and write it into the register 01. So again, this is then the instruction. We now know we want to load it from this address, the value here, and then load it into this register. So now we have both values 10 and 15 in our registers. And now we can do um, yeah, the calculation. So the third instruction. But maybe before we start or we continue there, um, Alex, are there any questions? In the chat, or is Nothing it? Nothing particular. Um, I think it's, it's so far it's clear. If there are any questions, please drop it in the in the yeah. in the chat. Um, we try to answer them. So now we have both our values in the registers, and as you already said, to make calculations, the CPU all needs all the information inside the registers. And the next thing is. Maybe the most important thing, if we want to add some numbers, is really to calculate 10 plus 15, and both values are here stored. So we increase the program counter again to the next address. Here is the next instruction. So we load the instruction. And as before, we saw, uh, or we, we look at the instruction now we have 0, 0, 001 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. and this then is an add instruction. So the first two bits are zero, which means the operation code is zero zero, and this instruction is different to before, where we loaded data. We now want to add some or we add two register values. As before, we have a destination register. So it's one, zero. So going back, uh, we have four registers here. We have here both values already stored. And we want to write the result into this register here. So the destination register is one, zero. And which values do we want to, to add? We have here a register left and a register right, which just means um, yeah, a left value and a right value of this add or of this plus symbol, which is in this case the 10 and the 15. So in other words, this instruction here, this 0010001, and in text is just add the values of the register 00 and register 01 and store the result into the register 10. And by doing that, we want to take both registers, both register values here. And now this arithmetic logic unit com comes into the game, so to say, and does the calculation for us. 
and then it writes back the values into this register, into the third register, where hopefully it's calculated correctly. Yeah, looks good. So the sum of 10 and 15 is 20, uh, 25. And that's the third instruction. So now we have calculated it and we already have the new calculated value. But it's not done yet because if we want to yeah, do further stuff with this, with this result, we need to write it back to the main memory somewhere because we now only have this result in the register and we need to have the result also in the main memory where we can use it then for more calculations. So the next instruction is really write this 25 back into the main memory. So we increase the program counter by one. The next instruction is here and it is 10101101, which means again, we store data now. So this first two bits, one zero, means we store something, we store data back into the main memory. The source address is 0, 1, which is this here. So we have this register 0, 1, and the value should be stored into the main memory. And the memory address where we want to store it is 1101, which is then this location here. And here we want to store the data. So in other words, we take the value of register 01 and store the value into the main memory address 1101. So let's do this. Execute now the instruction and you can see that we have written now in the main memory the value. So now we have written it back into the main memory and there's one last thing every program should do. So stop the program and um, any program you have to stop it because otherwise it run um, yeah, infinitely. So the last command is then this 1111111. We load it again into the instruction register. We look in our instruction set the first two bits are 1, 1, which then means we halt or we stop the execution of the program. All the other bits are just something like a, a code. Um, yeah, if everything works fine, if everything is okay. And we just want to stop the program. So we interpret this bits here as we want to stop the execution of the program. And yeah, then we stopped. And that's it. That was our five instruction. And we can see now we have just calculated this, which is 10 in decimal representation plus 15. And we wrote the result back here, which is 25. So there are so many steps in between by just making one simple calculation. And I just want to show you um, yeah, how many steps there are for these basic steps inside the CPU and in the main memory. So in a basic computer, we need five steps just for one calculation. Are there any questions now or was it understandable? Maybe that's a good question. Um, there are some questions, but um, I think we covered them in the chat already. Um, so in general, simplification of what a CPU actually is. So David explained this perfectly fine. Um, I, I really got it. Um, and the cool thing is actually when we, the question actually was, how does this all get into the memory? So in the main memory, actually, this is what we now do in this course. Um, we somehow want to get this into the main memory. And this is what we do as programmers. Um, we program something and 
the program is loaded into the main memory when we open it, actually. This is when you like open Windows with double click or Linux when you run a command. Um, then the program is loaded into the main memory and it's kind of separated into like instructions and data. So um, that the CPU knows which is an instruction, what is an instruction, what is data actually. So this is actually the point um, that the control unit does. Like, that's the data yeah. that should be um, held as an instruction. So, but, but I, I, um, let's be clear. So this, of course, is the program code we are writing. But of course, or um, thanks God, we do not write really these bits. So No, this is the reason why write, we have programming yeah. languages. For that, programming languages help us so we do not have to write these bits. Um, but in the background, when we write something in a programming language, there is something which converts then our simple written programming language into this machine representation. Right. And I think um, in a few minutes, Michi and Julia will, will also talk about how code is converted into this machine code which then can be executed from a CPU. Any other questions? I think everything else is explained in the chat already. So what, what happens if the program code reaches the stored value segment? A very interesting question. I don't, I don't want to get into detail, but that's a problem, of course. And that's why we have very interesting lectures like information security, where we talk uh, or want to exploit exactly problems like that. We will mention it already in this course already. So there's security issues that come up with these things, um, that you have an idea how computers handle these problems. But of course, these are problems, actually. And th these problems cause security issues with software. Okay, so yeah, our All time right. is is nearly at the end. So it's maybe we can just end, yeah. conclude um, what we have learned today. So we saw that data is really just numbers at any kind of representation. We can represent it at unary, binary, decimal, hexadecimal. There are other ways to represent data um, in computer science, especially in computers. Binary is the most common representation. And also if we talk about the location of values inside the memory, hexadecimal is mostly used for that. But it depends how we interpret the data. So we, we can interpret the data in so many ways. We can interpret this, the same um, bits as a color or as an instruction of a CPU or as ASCII characters. So there are so many ways we can interpret it. Then Alex talked a little bit about problem solving and how we can categorize and organize the books of data. Um, that was also very interesting because it gives you or it gave you an overview of the problems we have in computer science in a very basic example. And then we also had this flowchart representation of a problem where we have processes, conditions, which maybe conditions we will have um, many in the future, in the next lectures. So this will come very frequently to you. Then we have input output, so interact with a program or a computer. And then I talked about the components of a computer, um, the CPU, the main memory, how the data is stored into RAM, and how computer calculate something with data. So I'm finished now with our presentation. Alex, do you have something to add? I think I'm good for now. Um, I hope that the things were clear. And yeah, in case there are any questions, use Discord. We are happy to answer them and to help you, of course, with everything. So yeah, nice words in the end, please.
write this if you have problems. Uh, you have one week left for the homework, so shouldn't be um, that much uh, yeah, time issue now. Uh, thanks you, thank you for listening. Thank you for hope it yeah. hope it was it was uh, interesting for you. And we will give you now a short break of about fifteen minutes, and then Alex, ah, not Alex, Michi and Julia come back uh, with the practicals. All right. Yeah. Then have a good day, and um, I wish you a fun practical with Julia and Michi. Yeah, bye and bye. you also, Alex. Uh, have a nice day in the USA. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.